know your Lord. We learn about his names and his attributes. Know your Lord. What he approves and disapproves. Know your Lord. Believe in all things that he has run in a Know his oneness, Lord. Know your Lord. Part of the Right Belief series by Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid, right here on Suna Followers. Being taught by Ustada Layla Nasheba as she lays down the foundations to get you together. Learn about your Lord. Know your Lord. Streaming on all major platforms. Channel Suna Followers. Assalamu alaikum. Get to know your Lord. First part of the Right Belief series by Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid. This dynamic literary work of art's main goal is to revive and understanding the names and attributes of Allah. And understanding the name and attributes of Allah will elevate our faith strengthening in us and keep us steadfast. This wonderful book is now available in an audiobook format and can be found free of charge on YouTube channel Karim Abu Zaid. Get to know your Lord. You have nothing to lose. Ina alhamdulillah, wassalat, wassalam ala wa rasulullah. Oh, my tongue is twisting, I'm sorry. I want to welcome everybody to our Akita class. And mashallah, this is the class where uh, we are learning how to uh, believe in uh, the correct way uh, to believe in Allah and how to put that belief into practice. And I want to always remind everyone that it doesn't matter how many good deeds that we do, if our belief system is not correct and not on point, it has to not just be correct, it has to be on point. If our belief system is not on point, Allah is not accepting any good deeds, any of our good deeds. And again, for the shahadas, the new shahadas, let me... um. I just received about five, um, about 10 minutes before I started streaming. Um, was it Mickey? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're here. I see. Mickey, uh, who is one of our new Shahadas. Oh, Mike, I'm sorry. <laughs> he said his name is Mikey, not Mickey. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I understand. Okay, Mikey. Well, I'll call him Mike. Big Mike, <laughs> Big Mike sent me a, a text message and uh, he said that they were discussing in their new Muslim group uh, here, uh, they were discussing in their platform, uh, one of the um, one of the other uh, people that come to my classes, Edward or someone was explaining that Hadith, whereas, you know, all the new Muslims are, ta are taught this that once you convert to Islam, you're like a brand new baby, you're forgiven of all your sins. And I, I explain that it doesn't quite happen that, like that. That's not really correct. I mean, it's correct, but there's a little bit more that goes with that, that needs to be explained. And uh, Brother Mikey was asking me to um, explain it because they were discussing it in their Reddit group. And by the way, there, please guys, just to let you guys know, these people are from Reddit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I do have a Sooner Followers Reddit group, R-E-D-D-I-T. It's called Protectors of Suna. Protectors of Suna. And on all my videos, I do have that group, uh, the, uh, I, the, my TikTok group, which is Sooner Followers Online which we ain't got no members or at. And then uh, uh, the Reddit group is Protectors of Suna, okay? And uh, so you will see, and you will see Suna followers. So please join our Reddit group, okay? That's where these new Shahadas are from, Brother Edward and uh, Mikey now and Amy. I want to welcome all of you here. 
um, all of the Reddit group people uh, new, for, who are part of that um, new Shahada group. Okay, and I want to thank the sisters uh, for sending them to me because there's a they're part of other Reddit groups too that they send in their new shahadas to me. But anyway, let me explain this hadith that the, you guys were speaking about in the group. Yes, it's true. The Prophet wasalam, did say that once a person uh, 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 accepts Islam as their way of life, you are forgiven for all your sins, but it comes with a condition. Remember, I want everyone listening to me to remember the road to paradise is not easy. Allah doesn't sit around passing out tickets to paradise. Oh no, there's no two for one, no, uh, no freebies, none of that. You got to work for it. There's a second part to that hadith. The prophet did say that if a person embraces Islam, that he's forgiven of his past sins, but he goes on to say in that hadith, if the person is sincere, if they're sincere in believing in Allah, if they're sincere, and if a person is, Walaikum Salaam, Brother Ahmed, if a person is sincere, then that means that they will change the condition of themselves and do the obligations. Once you declare la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Dur Rasulullah, you have to start praying immediately. If you're a Muslim woman, you have to start dressing correctly immediately. You have to stop smoking, stop drinking, stop fornicating, stop doing all those sins immediately. And if you do, then Allah, as he says in the Quran, will change your bad deeds to good deeds. That's what that verse means. That's when that verse was sent down. Allah sent down that verse when the prophet was explaining what happens when you convert to this religion. All the bad deeds you did in the past are replaced with the good deeds. However, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued to say, if a person uh, uh, embarks upon this religion and they're not sincere, then your, you steal a, your good deeds, your bad deeds are not changed to good, okay? You're still held accountable for that. And the source of this hadith is Sahih Muslim. You know, we have to understand, guys, when it comes to the hadiths, you may read one sentence here, another sentence there, another sentence there, which is all part of a lecture, a 10 or 20 page lecture that the prophet gave about something. So don't just tell people that if I just say, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, that's it. I'm a Muslim and all my sins are forgiven. No, not unless you sincere. Not unless you change the bad deeds, replace those bad deeds with good ones. You have to stop the sins, stop deliberately, intentionally disobeying the law. And you have to start fulfilling the obligations. That's why I was telling you sisters and brothers too, I don't know who these Muslims are that's telling you guys that um, you have a, a, what they say, a grace period. There is no grace period in Islam. Uh, some of the people from this Reddit group was telling me that uh, uh, they listen to other speakers who tell them, it's okay, don't worry about it. You have a three month grace period. You can, you don't have to worry about praying. You don't have to worry about covering up. Just say, la ilaha illallah. I don't know why these brothers are telling y'all that they're not basing it on Islam. I don't know. It's like they just want people to say, la ilaha illallah. I mean, it, that's not correct. Okay, so that's the hadith. You know, you have to make the change. If a person is sincere, remember, we've been speaking about this sincerity. There's two conditions that must exi exist in order for Allah to accept our deeds. Number one, the intentions have to be sincerely for him. Number two, the deed has to be done the way Allah legislated. So if Allah is going to accept your shahada, accept your conversion, and in turn replace your bad deeds 
change them into good because of the good. You have to be sincere in, in this religion, okay? Affirmation of the tongue, and that's what we've been speaking about. The affirmation of the tongue that brings us into the folds of Islam. Then it has to go into your heart. And as the prophet said, whatever is in your heart will show through your actions. If you are sincere about this way of life, you'll be wearing hijab. You would be performing your prayers. You wouldn't be a Muslim woman shacking up with a Kafir man. This is a big problem. A lot of the you sisters are converting to Islam and you are not leaving your Kafir men. You cannot be married to a Kafir man. The marriage is null and void. You can't live with him. You can't shack with him. He's not your husband. You have to move out. You have to, when right before you even declare a lie, a and a lie, you should have left that home. You got to leave, move out of that. You can't hold on to that man. There is no grace, period. Allah is clear in the Quran. Allah says once they convert to Islam, do not send them back. Do not send your women back to those Kafir men. This is the law. So a lot of you sisters are converting to Islam on the internet and uh, you shacking up with a bunch of men. A stock for your law, you can't do that, okay? Allah is not forgiving you of your past sins. What's wrong with this picture? That's the same thing I say about women who make hajj and they don't have a mahram. That's one of the conditions of Hajj. What's the point in making Hajj if you're deliberately, intentionally disobeying Allah? Do you think Allah is going to forgive you of all your past sins if you are deliberately, intentionally doing something that you know he told you you can't do? If a woman doesn't have a mahram, that means she doesn't meet the criteria for Hajj. That means Hajj is not even incumbent upon her. That's what the companions said. That's the understanding the companions had. I don't care what the king of Saudi Arabia say. The king of Saudi Arabia is the one that did away with that and put his own law. Can't nobody make laws that contradict what a law says. A woman can't travel without a mahram, especially for Hajj. I made Hajj. You need that mahram to protect you. You need a man to cover your body with his when they punch you. You need a man to pick you up off the ground when you fall and the people don't step on you. A group can't do that because do you think another man is going to make Hajj and destroy his blessings by touching you when you are not lawful for him to touch? So that's the same oxymoron, you know. Why would you convert to Islam if you are deliberate and think that Allah is going to forgive you of all your sins when you're deliberately, intentionally going to hold on to sins? Same as making Hajj when you already got in your mind and your intentions to, to disobey Allah. You think Allah is going to accept that? Come on. We can't play with Allah. We can fool each other. We can play with each other, but you can't fool Allah. Mm -mm. Sincerity. As the prophet said, whatever is in the heart will show through your actions. Sincerity turns into submission. This is what we've been speaking about in this class. Affirmation of the tongue turns should cause you to submit. That's what Islam means, total submission to Allah. That's what the word Muslim means. I am one who submits to my Lord, to his laws, his commands, not my own, not man's. Y'all understand? So I hope that explains that, Hadi. And we're going to speak about this uh, as Brother Mike is typing right now. What makes people say things like this? Well, unfortunately, guys, um, after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam died, when he died, that was the first sign of the last hour. Oh yeah, as the Prophet said, my death will be the first sign that the last hour is near. And when he died, well, even before he died, some of these deviant groups appeared. Uh, people were embracing Islam, converting to Islam, but were they sincere? 
okay? There, a lot of them were converting to Islam and their heart was filled with conjecture. Their heart was filled with doubt. Their heart was filled with a lot of delusion. And it showed through their actions. They were challenging the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They began to challenge some of his commands as we're going to talk about today. So these deviant sects appeared during the time of the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then after his death, they grew more. And then as Islam expanded, when Islam expanded to, through the Persian Empire, uh, under the caliphate of um, uh, um, Umar, that's when a lot of these uh, other sets began to emerge, okay? And then as, you know, it continued on, as the companions began to die out, these sets, more and more and more and more other sets branched off of these two. And we're going to talk about uh, sectarianism today. We're going to talk about how these two major sectarian groups have a different understanding of faith remember as we talked about yesterday the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that whatever is in the heart is going to show through your actions he's he taught us that if a person believes in allah it's going to show through their actions and he talked about how faith increases faith decreases when we commit sin Faith leaves your heart completely and it doesn't come back until you stop that sin. Well, these two sectarian groups had different views on that. And we're going to talk about them. But before we get into them, I'm, as, as I promised I would do, uh, I'm going to give you guys another brief little quiz on um, the two obstacles that we struggle with that stand between our belief in the law and our practice, which is doubt, conjecture, and delusion. So let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen. Yeah, a lot of you asked me to start it off with that, with a quiz like that, and I will. I said I would. Okay, let me make it larger. Okay, I got this um, Zoom room in my way. So again, I. And that's going to be the topic today, faith, how it's uh, the faith begins with the tongue, the heart, and it shows through the limbs. But let me start it off with the quiz that you guys asked for on those three. Here's a scenario. Let me give you all this scenario. Think about it. Abdullah has been Muslim all his life. But he never recited the Tashahu when he was praying. And the reason why was because he never knew that the Tashahu was a pillar of the prayer. This is an example of which of the following? Is it an example of doubt, which means to question what you know to be correct? Or is Abdullah's... Uh, this situation an example of conjecture conjecture occurs from misinformation or is this an example of delusion delusion is to believe something is possible when it's not and vice versa so this is an example of what the simple fact that abdullah has been muslim all his life but he never recited the tashu in his prayers because he never knew that it was a pillar. He just didn't know. What is this an example of? Anybody in the Zoom room? I got a lot of answers on YouTube. Go ahead. It's, it's conjecture because that just means that he hasn't gotten the information or he maybe got misinformation on uh, how to, uh, uh, on reciting Sasha Hood. Mashallah, everybody got it right. Good job, Brother Ahmed. Good job, Sister Sakina. Good job, Latifa, Nadia, Margaret, even Askins. Mashallah. And my Reddit group, you guys got it right too. Mashallah. Mashallah. This is conjecture. And I put this question here just so you guys can see a lot of us suffer with conjecture. 
We just don't have the proper information about Islam. And this is what happens when we don't have the correct information. And that's why I want every one of you to understand that seeking knowledge, seeking knowledge of Islam is an obligation. Just like as Muslim women, we are obligated to wear hijab. Just as a Muslim man, you're obligated to go to the mosque. Well, all of us, male and female, we are all obligated to learn this religion. And this is something that we are abandoning today. So many of us are so caught up in working because we have to work that we lose our sight of purpose. We, our priorities become blurred. We put learning Islam on the back burner and we put secular education on the front burner. This is wrong. We have to constantly learn Islam. And I want you new shahadas to understand something else too. Just like in this case, uh, do you, what, what do you guys think? Do you think Allah is going to punish Abdullah? Uh, because he didn't, all the, the prayers he made, he didn't know. Or do you think all those prayers are wasted? What do you guys think? He's praying correctly now because he found out. Do you guys believe Allah is punishing him? Is going to punish him or hold him accountable for not knowing all those years before? What do y'all think? How would you answer that? Why not, Akis? Good job. Good job, Brother Ahmed. Good job, said the UN family is here. Assalamu alaikum. I love you all. Give my salam to the kids. Why not? Why because is it? Allah doesn't hold us responsible for anything we don't know. Okay, is that a is that permanent? So no, because once you know, once you know, you have to do. Okay, no, listen so, to the question. Okay, a lot of us will give that answer that Anissa gave. Allah doesn't hold us account, account for we don't know. That's true. But what about this? What if Abdullah had been Muslim all his life and died? Never. What if he died never uh, uh, reciting the Tashu during his prayer? No, he has the responsibility of learning his religion. Okay, that's the, the part, the second part that we don't talk, that the, the dia today don't tell you about. Okay? Allah will only temporarily excuse us. Allah will only temporarily excuse us from the obligations. Y'all understand what I'm saying? It's a good, he did learn. Since Abdullah learned the, the correct way, and now he's made that change. Alhamdulillah, Allah is not going to hold him accountable for what he didn't know before. But if Abdullah had a died in that state of not knowing that the Tasha who was a pillar, you guys know what would have happened? The angels, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells us in an authentic hadith, and Allah says it in the Quran. When the angels of death pull your soul, they're going to ask you, why didn't you know? Exactly, Fatima. Fatima knows where I'm going with this. The angels are going to ask you, how is it that Allah allowed you to live for 30 years on this earth and you didn't know how to pray correctly? Didn't you know that prayer is an obligation? Didn't you know that prayer is an act of worship that must be fulfilled the way Allah commanded? But you found time to learn how to be an engineer. You found time to learn how to cook. You found the time to learn how to, how to, uh, how to uh, be a journalist. But you didn't take the time to learn your religion. See, we don't think about that part of the hadith, okay? Allah will only excuse us temporarily for not knowing what we should know. You have to learn it. 
because Allah says seeking knowledge of this religion is an obligation upon all of you. The angels will say when they pull your soul, was not Allah's earth spacious? Were there not people on the internet that taught how to pray? Oh yes, those angels are gonna throw it all back up in our face. They're gonna say, you know, Sister Layla Nashiba taught classes every day and she taught the correct way to pray. You even heard people speaking about her, but you chose to not listen to her. You chose to listen to the denizens of shaitan and put your emphasis on politics. Oh yeah, the angels will throw all that up at us. You were too busy into the politics of the world instead of learning how to pray. So I want y'all to understand Allah only temporarily excuses us from things like this. So at this point, Abdullah, you know, is suffering with conjecture because he has no knowledge. He has no, inf he does not have the correct information on how to pray. And alhamdulillah, he learned before he died. But had he died in this state, it would have been a different thing. He wouldn't have been a kafir, but Allah would have held him accountable. Allah would have asked him, why didn't you know how to pray after when I gave you years? Let me give you all this hadith. That's the meaning of the hadith where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, anyone who Allah has blessed with a life, uh, with a, a life of 30 years, if Allah has allowed you to live for 30 years and you still don't know, Allah doesn't accept no excuse. Y'all understand that meaning of that hadith now? There's another version of the hadith where the prophet said 40 years. There's another version of that hadith where he said 50 years. And why did he give different numbers? Because the people that came asking him, one man was 30, another man was 40, another man was 50. And what the prophet was telling them is, it's an obligation for us to learn the basics. We ain't got to learn the history and stuff, but we have to know how to pray. You have to know the rules of fasting. You have to know what it means to believe in, in, in angels. We have to know this stuff. How is it that oh, you live to be 30 years old and you don't know that the Tashahud has to be recited? You live to be 40 years, but you found the time to learn how to, how to do other things. Does everybody understand that Hadith now? People in Zoom, do y'all understand it? Yes. Is Amina Fresno here? I can't see in there, y'all. Is she in there? Is Amina Fresno in the zone? I don't see her name. Okay, so she's not in there. Because she asked me about that hadith too. There's another hadith there where the Allah says the age of 50. Okay, but that, the, I mean, the prophet said the age of 50. The reason why he said different ages is because the people that asked him the question were of different ages. We have to learn this religion. So Abdullah's excused now. Thank God. All right. What about this one? This question. Sarah. Sarah has a hard time accepting. Now, this, this is from a sister here. Her name has been changed. She's one of my Reddit sisters. <laughs> Sarah, she has a hard time accepting that a man is allowed to have more than one wife in Islam. A lot of women struggle with that. Women that's been Muslim all their life struggle with that. That's a female thing. Women are jealous. I mean, we are like that, you know? Sarah has a hard time accepting that a man is allowed to have more than one wife in Islam. But she believes it's oppressive against women. She believes that polygamy is oppressive against women. And she wonders, often wonders, why would Allah allow such a thing to be part of our religion? 
based on the information I've given you here, is a Sarah suffering from doubt? And doubt, again, is to question what you know to be true or correct. Or is she suffering from conjecture, which occurs from misinformation? Or is she deluded, which means believe something is possible when it's not or vice versa? And by the way, sometimes we can suffer from all three. What do you guys think? Do you guys think she's suffering from one, two, or all three, or, or what? What do y'all think? I think she's suffering from doubt the most because she she's being told the right information based on the fact that she's finding it hard to accept, not believe. Um, and she's questioning Allah's laws and why he would do something. Good job. Y'all, do y'all agree with her that, she, that the thing that she's suffering from the most is doubt? Y'all believe? Everybody's yeah, good job. That's true. This is doubt because she's given the correct information. She's taught. She comes to my classes. She knows that polygamy is good and clean. Mm -hmm. Everything that Allah made lawful is good and clean. <laughs> it's good. It's clean. Okay. And Allah would never impose anything upon us that's oppressive. Now, the fact that she believes it's oppressive, the fact that she believes that it's uh, uh, something that's bad for women, is that also another uh, obstacle here that she may suffer with? Okay, Rick said delusional. She's delusional. That too, that's true. That's true, Rick. Not only is she suffering with doubt because she's questioning why Allah would do something. Good job. Good job, Sister Ying, uh, the family of, of the Yuan. Exactly. She's also delusional. Maybe because of life. Maybe because of her experiences uh, before Islam. Or maybe she was married to a man who practiced polygamy and he, he did it the wrong way. So he's deluded her. She doesn't believe it's possible that polygamy could be good. She doesn't believe it's possible that polygamy can be clean. I just had a sister. She's not a new Shahada. The reason why I put this on the quiz, one of my Reddit sisters from Reddit, she said that she's been in polygamy and she kept getting chlamydia over and over and over again. So her question to me is, Sister Layla, how is it that we can say that polygamy is good and clean? She said, when I got all kinds of medical problems, because my husband's other wives were nasty women. I kept getting chlamydia and now my, my organs are messed up. She said polygamy is dirty, it's filthy. This is what she said. This is on Reddit. She came to me on Reddit. I told her, no, sister, don't blame a law. Y'all see that video I put out the other day? That's one of the reasons I put that short out. Don't blame a law for the sins of man. Your husband shouldn't have married women that were filthy. That's his problem. And I can also say to you, why did you stay with him? If you kept getting chlamydia over and over again and your life was in danger, your health, why did you stay married to him? I would have told him to tell those nasty women to clean they self up or I'm divorcing you. I told her you could have taken a stand. I said, don't blame a law for the sins that man commits. Your husband chose to marry nasty women. You chose to stay married to him. As a result, 
you got the nasty woman's disease. I mean, I know this, I'm just keeping it real. I have to keep it real. It's, I'm a dyer. You caught the nasty woman's disease because you put your love for your husband over your love for yourself and your health. So don't blame it on a law. Polygamy's good and clean. I said a lot of us practice polygamy. We ain't never got no chlamydia. Okay. Why would you be with a man that, that doesn't care what type of women he lay with? That's why I put that short out. And when I came to her with that, she was like, you're right. She couldn't blame. She, could, I, she couldn't blame it on the law. She said, you're right. She said, you're right. I, I, sh I should have known better. I said, yeah, so don't blame a law. Don't make what a law made good and clean uh, a haram because you chose to stay with a person that abused the laws of a law. Okay, so a lot of us suffer with doubt and a lot of us suffer with delusion because of our experiences in life. Because you had a bad experience in life, you're now deluded into thinking that, that it's a law's fault, that a law made something good and clean, bad and dirty when he didn't. That was your choice to stay in a filthy relationship like that. And by the way, for you sisters out there, that chlamydia ain't nothing to play with. That's a filthy disease. You go to the doctor to get a checkup. That's why I tell you sisters, y'all need to go to a doctor and get checked up at least twice a year. If you find out that you got chlamydia, that's, that's a bad thing. You tell your husband he better get rid of them nasty women or you got to walk. That's a nasty disease. OK, and it can destroy you. you you end up having to have a hysterectomy. Like this sister. OK, let's look at the I think I got another question here. Yeah, here's the last one. What about this? Abdul sees what's happening in Gaza and he listens to the emotional lectures people give about it. He also has a list put out by, and the name has been changed, put out by El Jihad, <laughs> by El Jihad News, about how all companies in America support Israel's war and how they should be boycotted by all Muslims. Abdul trusts El Jihad because they are Muslims. And he believes that any Muslim who does not boycott American companies is a Kafir. This is an example of what? Is this an example of doubt, questioning what he knows to be correct? Or is this an example of conjecture, which occurs from misinformation? Or is this an example of delusion? He believes something is possible when it's not and vice versa. Which one stands out the most? Which one stands out the most? Doubt, conjecture, or delusion? Which one would you guys say stands out the most that he's suffering with? People in Zoom? People in Zoom? Okay, think, go ahead. I think maybe conjecture. Exactly. Misinformation from another source. Exactly. Conjecture, number one. Good job, Sister Annette, too. And every Nadia, everybody, Fatima, I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, what's her name? Margaret. Exactly. Conjecture. This is misinformation. And that's why I tell you guys, be careful what y'all hear on TV. Everything on TV ain't true. And those lists that these Muslims put out about companies, how do you know that crap is true? Exactly. You guys are Americans. Y'all live in America. And as I've been trying to tell you, can anybody in America just take their money and send it to Israel? Come on. 
I am the CEO of Sooner Followers Online. Can I take the money from Sooner Followers Online and send it to Israel? Come on, y'all. Y'all know the banks wouldn't let it get passed and the banks would notify Homeland Security. Sooner Followers would be in jail. Shut down and I'll be in jail. Needing somebody to come put some, some money on my books. Okay? This is conjecture. Exactly as the UN family said, we have to stop blindly following people. Stop blindly believing people. You know, we have to investigate. Allah tells us in the Quran, when people come to you with news, especially if it's bad news, you first of all investigate to see if the news is accurate. Okay? And because our brother Abdul didn't investigate, he's going around calling Muslims kafir because they're not boycotting. And first of all, does Allah say that we have to boycott? Is that a part of Islam? Do Muslims boycott and protest? Or do Muslims make dua? Muslims don't boycott. Muslims don't protest. That's not our way. That's the way of the non-believers. That's not our way. That ain't ever happened in Islamic history. Never in Islamic history will you find any of the Muslims boycotting and protesting with signs and stuff. We don't do that. That's how Kafirs do. Our greatest weapon of mass construction is dua and piety. We were outnumbered in every battle, outnumbered, outmanned, and outweaponed. But how did the early Muslims get victory in every battle they fought? Because of their taqwa and their dua. That's what we do. We don't boycott. We don't protest. That's not our way. That's the non-Muslim way. But Abdul, you know, he has no information. He doesn't know his religion. So it's conjecture. What else is he suffering from? So he doesn't know what, what's correct, but is there another one that he's suffering from too, besides conjecture? Delusion, because he's believing that, um, believing something impossible. Exactly, yeah. mashallah, he's delusional. This is America. You can't send no money to no government. I'm sorry, it don't happen. That's a delusion. So not only is he suffering with conjecture, but he's also delusional. Exactly. Do you guys see why it's so important for us to learn our religion? This is why the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, told the companions, because remember, guys, the companions, they were engaged in war from the beginning of their conversion to their death. The prophet told them, don't get involved in the politics. You're not going to find any hadith on this planet. Whereas the prophet and his companions, even under the caliphate of Abu Bakr and, uh, and Umar, they never got involved in the politics of the Romans, the politics of the Persians, the politics of the Egyptians. They never got involved in that. The prophet didn't teach us to get involved in the politics. The prophet didn't taught us don't choose sides with, with these unbelievers. We live amongst them, okay, in peace, unless they make a play at us. Now, when they come at us, that's when we get involved. We get involved when they come at us. And we're not deluded. Don't get deluded into thinking that they'll be your friends. He taught the companions, don't ever get deluded into believing that you can trust them. Don't ever be become deluded into thinking that they're going to be truthful with you. The prophet taught the companions, stick to a law, stick to a law's rules in combat, stick to what a law says and call upon him, make dua to him. Don't take on the ways of the Kafir.
That's how the prophet taught the companions. That's what Umar said too. When Umar sent his armies out, don't take on the ways of the Kafir. Remember our greatest weapon is our piety and our supplication to Allah. The same thing with Abu Bakr. When Abu Bakr sent Khalid bin Walid and them out, what did he tell him? Don't take on the ways of the Kafir and don't get involved in their crazy politics. You stick to the ways of Allah, our ways, and have piety. The same thing with, with Uthman, same thing with Ali. We deviate away from that. Like I told you guys the other day, we Muslims today, we fight like Kafirs. We act like them, we look like them, we dress like them, we talk like them, and we fight like them. We protest and we boycott. Instead of praying, making dua, and correcting ourselves, and investigating information, we don't do that. We're just like the non-belief. We, we, we fight like Kafirs today. That's why ain't no victory coming here. And I'm here to let you guys know, this is not a war against Gaza. This is a war against Islam. Like I've been telling y'all, it started in the Bush regime. It's just spread it to that part. It's past Gaza now. It's in Bangladesh. It's all over Africa. It's going to be right here in America. It's going to be in the UK. This war ain't stopping. This is the war against Islam that the prophet told us would come. Don't get it deluded. We're too deluded. Keep your focus. Don't be deluded. Keep the focus. And Allah sent this war because we have deviated away from him. We don't practice Islam correctly. We don't know the lawful and unlawful. Our belief system is tainted. We look like Kafirs, act like Kafirs, complain like Kafirs, and we fight like them too. sad. So delusion, conjecture, and doubt. These are the three obstacles that stand between our belief in Allah and our practice. And today we're going to continue it. We spoke yesterday about how two groups emerged. These groups emerged. One group believes that despite the fact that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said numerous times that faith increases and decreases, despite the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that your actions are symbolic of what's in your heart, we have one group that says this is not true. We have this group that believes, oh no, no, faith doesn't increase, nor does it decrease. And our actions have nothing to do with it. Sins have nothing to do with it. And then we have another group that took it to the other extreme. They said, oh, if a person commits a sin, he's a Kafir, that's it. If a person truly believes in Allah, he would never commit a, a major sin. But since he committed a major sin, he's Kafir, he's a hypocrite, he wasn't Muslim ever. Well, both of these groups are wrong. And so today I'm going to break it down. We're going to start with the fact that, first of all, one of the reasons why these two groups have deviated is because they don't understand that the heart, affirmation of the heart is an essential condition of faith. Well, here's the Dalil. Listen to what Allah says and the interpretation of the meaning. And let me make this bigger. I'm going to make my picture smaller so you guys can screenshot. By the way, take the screenshots of these verses. Okay, that's better. That's better. The people from Reddit, y'all can see that. Okay, mashallah. <laughs> okay. Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, O messenger of Allah, let them not grieve you. 
who hasten into disbelief of those who say we believe with their mouths, but in their hearts, they don't believe. And from among the Jews, they are listeners to the falsehood, listening to other people who have not yet come to you. And they distort the words, change the words beyond their proper usages, saying that if you are given this, take it. But if you are not given it, then beware. But he for whom Allah intends uh, trials, never will you possess the power to do for him a thing against Allah. Those who are the ones for whom Allah does not intend to purify their hearts, for them in this world is disgrace. So here we can see in this verse of the Quran, Allah is speaking to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, telling him, don't let these people worry you. These people who come to you quickly declaring la ilaha illallah. But in reality, it's all a front. They really don't believe in me. And they really don't accept you as a messenger. They have an ulterior motive because this is what the prophet was faced with. When he went to Medina, guys, a lot of the Jews were converting to Islam just to spy on him. A lot of the Jewish tribes had allegiances with the Quraysh and they felt that they could infiltrate the prophet's camp and get information because they knew that once you say la ilaha illallah muhammad or rasulullah your life your honor and your property is sacred they knew that once they converted to islam the prophet couldn't kill them he had to sit there and deal with whatever fitin they had so the allah was letting the prophet know you got a lot of people coming here who are coming into islam you can't do anything to them, but I know I am a law. I will disgrace them. I can see in their hearts. I know that they're not sincere. And when I see into you and see what you're doing, I will send my, my fitna to you. I will send my punishment to you. And there's nothing a person can do to stop it. So this just shows from this verse here, you know that faith is in the heart and if it's in the heart it's going to show through your actions these men were very hypocritical towards the prophet they were calling him out they were challenging what the things he said they would go behind his back and talk about him try to turn the people against them that's not the action of a believer okay also in another verse, Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, whoever disbelieves in Allah after he claims to believe in him, except for a person who is forced to denounce his religion while his heart is secure. But for those who willingly, willingly disbelieve upon them is the wrath from Allah. And again, these verses were sent down because people were converting to Islam, not out of sincerity but to infiltrate and try to cause uh, problems for the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these two verses here are evidence that affirmation of the heart is a condition of faith. If you don't truly believe in Allah in your heart, there's no way around that. And also the tongue. How do we affirm belief with the tongue? That's the shahada. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning. Say, O oh believers, we have believed in Allah and what has been revealed to us and what has been revealed to Abraham and Ismail and Isaac and Jacob and the descendants and what was given to Moses and Jesus and what was given to the prophets from their Lord. And we make no distinction between any of them. And we are Muslims by submission to him. So if they believe in the same as you believe in, then they have been rightly guided. But if they turn away, they are only in dissension and Allah will be sufficient for you against them. So this is affirmation of the tongue. 
When we declare la ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah, we declare it with our tongue. And not only that, we declare that we believe in what all the prophets, because all the prophets were Muslim. All the prophets were Muslim. Their religion was Islam. What we believe in is what they believed in. They believed in Allah's angels. They believed in Allah's books. They believed in Allah's destiny, predestiny. They believed in paradise, hell, and everything that Allah commanded. So we affirm that with our tongue when we take that shahada. And again, whatever is sincere in the heart is going to show through your actions. Listen to what Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning. Oh, you who have believed. So he's addressing those of us who took shahada. What Allah is saying, oh, you who have believed. In other words, oh, you who have taken shahada. Now that you Muslim, bow and prostrate and worship your Lord and do good so you can succeed. I want all my shahadas in Reddit to pay attention. Those people who are telling you that you have um, a grace period to practice Islam, where's their dalil? This is from Allah. Allah is saying, since you have converted, now you have to begin to show the sincerity of your faith by praying and worshiping your Lord and doing good. There is no grace period. Everybody see this verse? This verse is the Dalil. No grace period. Once we say la ilaha illallah, we got to show it through our actions. Start wearing that hijab. Start making that whatever prayer is in, you got to pray it. Stop drinking, stop smoking, stop fornicating. Also, Allah says in the interpretation, the meaning, and that is paradise, which you are made to inherit because of what you used to do. Allah is letting us know because of the actions of the limbs, because we didn't just say we believe in Allah with our tongue, but we showed it through our behavior and actions, we will inherit paradise. And also Allah has associated certain actions like prayer, you know, with faith. For example, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, and never will Allah have caused you to lose your faith. This is the Dalil for what I was telling the sisters about the polygamy. Don't sit there and blame it on Allah. Never would Allah have caused you to lose your faith. Polygamy is good and clean. It's good and clean. You chose to stay married to a man who married filthy women. You chose to stay with a man that kept giving you chlamydia. Don't blame it on Allah. Allah would never cause you to lose your faith. Blame yourself for staying in a filthy relationship like that. Okay, there's a dalil for that. So again, we can see from the meaning of this verse that the reward of doing what Allah commands us to do, the prayers and all of that, you know, it's gonna bring about the benefits of paradise for us, okay? Our good deeds will not be lost. Even in the event of when the Muslims were praying, when they first began to pray, they used to pray facing the direction of, of, of Jerusalem. But then Allah sent down the verses saying to change the direction to Mecca. Some of the Jews began to tease the Muslims. They said, oh, all that pr those prayers you did, all those prayers that you did towards uh, Jerusalem, you didn't get no reward for them. That's when Allah said, oh, this ain't true. Allah will never cause you to lose your faith, never cause you to lose your deeds like that. Okay? And that's the same thing I say for the sister who asked me about that polygamy situation. Because your husband kept giving you chlamydia over and over because his other wives were filthy. Don't blame Allah. Blame you yourself for being with a man that wouldn't clean up his wives. 
Hey. All right. So even the hadiths, we have many hadiths that show that faith and action go together. For example, our prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, faith has over 70 odd branches, the best of which is to, to declare la ilaha illallah. And the least is to pick up something off the street that a person may trip over. So again, this hadith shows that there's different levels of faith, different levels of faith. And again, if depending on where you are in your faith, it will cause you to do certain actions. I'm strong in my faith. So I could care less what the Kafirs say about how I look. So I'm going to go out the house with my hijab on, my abaya on. I could care less what the Kafirs say. Okay? I believe in Allah. I fear a law. I could care less how people say Layla Nasheba has a loud voice. A law commands me to have a loud voice. A law commands me to be intimidating when I'm in the public, not aggressive, uh, intimidating. So I don't care what people say about my voice. A law loves my voice. Like a law says, perhaps you hate something that a law loves and brings good from. Subhanallah. So whatever is in the heart is going to show through the actions. So now I'm going to get to these groups. How did it all go wrong? Well, there are, there are two main branches of groups. The Karajites and the Mutezali. The Karajites and the Mutezali. Yeah, we're going to talk about them. Now, both of these groups agree with the people of the Sunnah that our actions are part of faith, but they differ in ruling on a man who commits sin. How do they differ? The Karajites, I call them Karajites, the Karawich, they regard a person who commits a sin as an apostate. And they say he can come back to Islam if he stopped doing the sin. But if he don't stop doing the sin, he's an apostate. So for you brothers who smoke cigarettes, you're an apostate unless you stop. You sisters that don't wear hijabs, you are an apostate unless you start wearing hijab. You brothers who don't pray because you're lazy, you're an apostate. Okay, that's the Karajites. The Mutezala, they say that in this world, the person who commits a major sin is in between belief and disbelief until he repents. How many of you have heard these famous speakers? A lot of them down in Texas. A lot of the famous brothers in Texas, how many times have y'all heard them say this? Once a person commits a major sin, he's in a place between belief and disbelief. How many of you have heard these brothers say that? Those are your mutazali, okay? But both of these groups agree that this person will be in hellfire forever. They say that this person, if the person does not repent and they die upon a major sin, they'll never come out of hell. This is the belief of the Karajites and the Mutazali. We have a lot of Mutazali here in America. If y'all listen to these famous brothers speak, you will hear them say that. Oh, yeah, we have to be careful about the sins we commit, the major sins. You know it's a major sin. You're, in, you're not a Kafir, but you're in a place. You're in between. I just listened to a famous brother from out of Texas give that lecture just today. I'm like, whoa, there you go. Now, the Karajites. When did they appear? 
The Korajites, this was the first sect to appear in the Muslim world. They appeared during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, uh, Mukhtar, when he was giving y'all the life of the prophet, he spoke about the presence of the first Korajite. His name was Dul Kuwaisira at Tamimi. At Tamimi. He was from the tribe of Tamim. <clears throat> he was the one that got angry at the prophet's way of distributing the money. Remember? This, he was the one that came to the prophet and said, oh, prophet of Allah, fear Allah. And the prophet said, who will obey Allah if I don't fear him? Would Allah trust me as a messenger over the people, but you don't trust me? You think that I'm not being fair with how I'm distributing this money? The man then turned around and left. That was the first emergence of the Karajites. Okay? That when that man turned to walk away, that's when the prophet said, talked about him. He said, I can see him now. And I can see his followers after them, after him. Young men who shave their heads. Young men who shave their heads. And these are the ones that are quick, quick, quick to cause a, to call a Muslim a Kafir. Y'all understand that? Does it sound familiar? Muslims today who have inherited this ideology, these are the men, the famous brothers y'all see on YouTube who are always excommunicating and boycotting Muslims without a right. They're the ones who are called, uh, their ideology is called takfiri. Takfiri. We're going to make takfir. We're going to make takfir. We're going to make takfir against Sister Layla. We're going to make takfir against so-and-so. We're going to make takfir against Sheikh so-and-so. Those are your Karajites. And if you look at a lot of these brothers, look how they shave their heads, just like the prophet said. They will shave their heads bald and, or shave their heads. Long beards, shaving heads, making takfiri, excommunicating people, boycotting people. Boycott Sheikh Lail, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Lail. Boycott Sheikh Lail because he drinks Starbucks. Boycott, excommunicate, shake so and so, because he's he 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 doesn't protest. All right, those are the Karajites. You a Kafir? They they always calling somebody a Kafir. So even though the original Karajites are long gone, their ideology still exists. And there's a lot of people who ascribe to that group. A lot of these brothers that y'all see in, in European countries that are, that's always making talk theory. This is their ideology. Be careful of the internet, I keep telling y'all. What about the Mutezala? Okay, they emerge towards the beginning of the second century. And the founder of this set was a man named Ibn Atta. He was a student of El Hassan El Basri, who was one of the Tabi'in, okay? He separated from El Hassan El Basri after a discrepancy that appeared between them about major sins, okay? He held the position that was taken from uh, Greek mythology and stuff. Remember guys, when Islam spread through the Persian empire, Ibn Sina and his group, that's when the, uh, they, they converted to Islam and they began to mix philosophy with Islam rather than basing everything on the Quran and Sunnah, it's philosophy. We see a lot of these brothers today here in America. 
A lot of them right here in America, they're the ones that speak about Islam. They'll tell you to stay away from major sins because you're in a, a position where you're between faith and disbelief. You know, and the philosophy, they're always talking about the philosophy behind it. The psychology behind it. They're always mixing psychology, sociology, philosophy with what they say, with Islam. These are these people. Rather than stick with what Allah says in the Quran, rather than stick with what the prophet said in Hadith, you know, they use uh, their PhDs in science, philosophy, and all of that. And these are the people that bring about many innovations. Many innovations such as celebrating birthdays. They're the ones that do that uh, uh, maul it, innovation. Let's support the LGBTQ too. Oh yeah, these are the Mutazali. Let's support the LGBTQ community because if we support them in turn, they can fight for us. These are the people who deny the Carter of Allah. They don't believe that Allah is the creator of evil that man creates his own evil. They also deny or and distort the names of Allah. Many of the Sufis, the Sufi sets fall into the Mutazila. There's so many different sets of them. America has more Sufis than anything. 